Welcome back. My name is Joe and I would like to introduce you to the KEF KC92. I've previously reviewed the KC62, the smaller version with six and a half. These are dual nine inch drivers in this. And let's find out what this is all about. So for full disclosure, KEF did reach out to me. This is a sponsored review but I'm able to say whatever I want about this. They've acknowledged that I will say the pros and cons of this product and they don't get to review this prior. I want you guys to be the judge as to whether this review is fair or not. Is Kef's newest offering. It is their most expensive one in this lineup. They do have some newer, less expensive ones. This is currently selling for $1,999. And as far as the intended audience, I'm not too sure, maybe two channel, could be good for home theater. Let's try to dig into this and see exactly what it does and let you guys decide whether it's something that might be right for you. So first of all, I think overall the design, typical Kef fashion, it looks pretty awesome. Has a gloss finish on this particular one, similar to the SVS SB3000 that I previously owned. Just a nice gloss finish. It has the seamless cone, no dust cap to be seen. This, I guess, is kind of like a giant dust cap. And also, it has what they call a P-surround, which is an inverted surround with a different shape to it that controls the excursion of the woofer and keeps it more linear. If I turn this around to the back, you'll see that they do have a Class D amplifier and this nice big heat sink over here. And it has various controls. I'll go over them real quick. Service, I'm not sure what the system button is. Has a 12-volt trigger. Your crossover, you can set it to LFE if you want it to just not do anything and allow your AVR to do everything. And it ranges from 40 hertz all the way up to 140 hertz. Has your volume control here. And then it has a phase adjustment switch that switches from 0 to 180 degrees. And then different EQ modes where you can choose from room, wall, corner, cabinet, and apartment mode. You can set it to turn on via the 12 volt trigger auto wake up when it senses the signal or always on. Then it has this ground lift feature. So if you are getting hum, which I've had before on previous subwoofers, you can choose the ground lift and that may resolve the issue. It also has a connection if you want to use high level speaker inputs, it has your line input. They call it smart connect. So it detects whether you have one thing plugged in or two and maximizes the gain structure. So you are going to get the most output out of it. Now it also has this high pass filter so you can daisy chain multiple together and you would use these dip switches if you're going to use one of these outputs to go into another subwoofer. But otherwise it does have a high pass filter in case you want to output to some speakers. I'll talk about that later. Your on and off switch and the power plug. So I've already mentioned the dual nine inch drivers that comes out to around a 13 inch cone surface area. So you could say that this is equivalent to maybe something like the SB3000 as far as cone surface area. It does have a thousand watts RMS, so 500 going to each driver and they are dual opposed. So you'll see there's a driver on this side and a driver on this side. So they oppose each other, which means that when this is at full tilt, there's no cabinet shake. It doesn't walk off. It just, it's kind of weird. You see the cone moving, but the enclosure itself doesn't move. They claim a frequency response of 11 hertz to 200 hertz, which is, that's crazy. And they say that this has a maximum output of 110 dB. We will go into all of those in detail and see if that's actually true. They have something called their IBX intelligent base extension technology, and it's supposed to just kind of dynamically enhance the base. We will also go into that in more detail. As far as uh, impressions, the first thing I would say is that I unboxed this and for a $2,000 subwoofer, I would say that they should kind of, I expected a little bit of a better experience personally. You know, it comes packaged in the typical foam that kind of breaks up and goes everywhere. They should use that nice foam. You know what I mean? A bag, all, you know, the whole experience for an expensive sub like this. I know a lot of you guys are gonna want me to compare this to other subwoofers. There are too many out there to compare them to, but I can just compare them to some that I've had previously. So SB3000, that is a less expensive subwoofer, 13 inch driver. Mine also had a nice gloss finish. And I think 
it's a 800 watt amplifier if i'm not mistaken and that one was very impressive a lot of people seem to like it it also has dsp and app capability less expensive i would say that that one has more just raw output capability because it's a larger driver and with a larger driver you're able to have more output but that particular one also has its limits and i'm able to reach those limitations if i'm playing them in my home theater and playing some ridiculously loud bass content yeah you can hear where it's reaching its limits this one is a smaller enclosure and the drivers are just it's a different arrangement so instead of one large driver this has two smaller drivers this one has more power and they're doing a lot of stuff with dsp to compensate in various ways i have a bunch of larger subwoofers and with subwoofers it's a very simple game if you have a larger subwoofer more power you get more output lower bass extension all these things but i think what kef was going for here was they wanted to provide a subwoofer that was small that could still play deep and hoffman's iron law says that you can choose those but you can't choose loud also but they're kind of figuring out a way to do all of those things where it can play low it's small it can play loud and kind of at the same time not exactly let's just get into it right now so this dynamic limiting is what i'd call it they call it ibx right so intelligent bass extension i think what it's basically doing is it's using dsp processing to not just limit the output capability so typical sub they use limiters so that you don't blow up the sub right so when you play it really loud it's going to start to say no 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 we can't that's a little too much it's not going to go up any louder so it uses a limiter this one does something dynamically which is as you turn it up it changes the frequency shape and you can see that here So when it's at lower volumes, it has a flatter response and it extends down further. As you turn it up, it starts limiting those lower frequencies, which are the hardest ones to reproduce. So that's one part. But then the other part is I was playing pink noise through this. And what I noticed is that it did have a limit to how loud it could get. That's what we expect, right? But if I were to play a certain sine wave, like a single tone, 20 Hertz tone, it would allow it to play that tone at a much higher volume. So that's smart. Instead of saying, okay, there's a cap. This is as loud as it's gonna get at any frequency. It says, well, let me take a look at the content and see. So if I'm playing a bunch of frequencies at the same time, well, that's very demanding. It has to try to do all of those equally. But if it only has to play one bass note that's a certain frequency, well, it can kind of allocate more resources, more power to that one thing. That is something that I've never seen a subwoofer do. And I'm kind of wondering how that will affect the CEA or CTA 2010 measurements that people do. I don't do those, but hopefully someone like Aaron does. We'll have to wait and see. So what goes with that is it definitely has to have a capable amplifier Everything has to be capable of doing these things, but it also has to have some DSP smarts in here. And one thing that I noticed is as I turn this up, it seems like this has some kind of fan in here that I could hear. I've never reviewed a subwoofer with a fan and I can't confirm whether that is true because I can't see in here. I went in with a flashlight, but as I turned it up, I could hear kind of like a squeal from it. I'm pretty sure that that is something that they might want to look at because I'm pretty sure that's not something that they would intend to happen. So I'm going to start turn this up. So I'm playing a really low test signal. I'm not sure what that was caused by, but from my work, having an IT business for a long time, it sounds like a fan that squeals as you turn it up but it does ramp up and slow down 
and the noise changes as you turn it up and down. At first, I thought it was air coming from one of the RCA ports or something like that. I've seen that happen before, maybe one of the screws, but that isn't the case. So you can see that the output capability of this is pretty shocking for dual nine inch woofers in a small cabinet. I wouldn't say it's ridiculously out of reach because there are other subwoofers that are slightly larger like the SB3000 that does play down to 18 Hertz, except it doesn't do it dynamically. It just does that up to a certain limit and then that's it. A few other things I'd like to mention is that this paint seems very easy to scratch. If it's anything like the SB3000 that I had, you want to be very careful with this as far as like what you wipe it down with. This does not have an adjustable high pass frequency. It's a set high pass crossover. And the main thing that I'm kind of curious about and I've been asking for from multiple audiophile subwoofers is a way to delay the output to account for the delay that's inherent in this. So as far as the delay, I've measured this at about 12 to 13 milliseconds, which is kind of high. The SVS runs around six milliseconds. So about twice as much on this, that might be because of all the things that it has to process, has to figure out what the content is, what is the capability, what volume are you at? And so it has to do that in real time. That causes delay. 12 milliseconds is kind of high, but that would not be an issue if you had a built-in delay in the RCA output. So if you were to use this in a two-channel setup and you went in through here, out to other speakers, and those speakers had a delay that compensated that were also 12 milliseconds in delay, then you'd have no issue because it, the sound would arrive at you at roughly the same time. This didn't have that. That's one feature that I would request from whoever wants to do it. Please do that. That would not be an issue if you're planning on use this with an AVR or something that has kind of a room correction type thing where you could add delay to the main speakers. A lot of people won't use this with something that has that capability. So you may want to look into something like the Mini DSP 2x4 HD or the SHD where you could do all of those things on that device. This doesn't have it built in. This does allow you to use a wireless adapter that they provide. They didn't send me that, so I wasn't able to test it. And I do believe that this integrates with their other KEF powered speakers. They have an app for it. I don't have those, so I can't speak on how well and how seamless that integration works. I did test this in two rooms. I tested it in my studio setup where it was near field. And yeah, it does have good amount of output. It does have low bass extension. It can get pretty loud. And the one thing I will say about this is their limiters are very advanced in that you never hear them really kick in. They're gradual. So if I play a loud test tone, it will try to sustain that as long as possible, but then you'll see the SPL start to drop slowly. It's not like it hits it and then drops down and you know that would be audible. But it's not something I heard from music and listening to movies, nothing like that. The other thing is that it will not allow you to hear any bad noises from it. So I've tried to kind of abuse this in a way and play some loud test tones and super loud bass notes and like instantaneous ones where I'd unpause, play, and try to have the burst come out and see if I can make this behave badly, but it never did, never made any bad sounds. And it just kept this composure the entire time. And so yeah, good job Kef on that. I've tested this in my living room where I typically use two very inexpensive monolith THX eight inch subwoofers. And those things are pretty awesome because they're inexpensive and they're about the same sizes of this. Now those definitely don't have the same basic extension. They only go down to about 24 Hertz. They don't have as much output. So you'll hear when they can't handle, but they're extremely inexpensive. So I have two of them in there. And what I would say to people is regardless of what sub you get, whether it's this, another one, definitely look to get at least two subs because room modes, you know, peaks and dips in the response. It doesn't matter how good this subwoofer is. It doesn't matter that they have different EQ for room, wall, corner, cabinet, apartment. Nothing that you can do here or with DSP can fix a dip or null in the response. That can only be fixed using multiple subs or changing the listening position or where the subs themselves are placed. So two or more, if you can afford four of these, go for it. In my living room situation, compared to the dual eights, 
because of those room modes, the dual eights kind of filled in some of the modes and I've EQ'd them so that it's kind of not a fair comparison. But as far as output, if I had two of these, definitely it would, it would annihilate those other ones that I have there. So yeah, I think it would be good for movies. I would say in a small to mid-sized room, don't expect this to replace your giant 18s and 24s and giant subwoofers. It, it, it can't do that. So pros and cons, I would say pros would be that it's small. It does kind of what they say it's going to do. It does. I'm, I was playing 12 hertz test tones through this. It was shaking stuff. So it was playing that. It was playing it, that particular test tone, at a pretty loud volume. It can play certain frequencies loud. It just can't play all of the frequencies at the same time at a loud volume. Limitations. Hoffman's Iron Law still wins regardless of all this DSP processing that's going on here. But I think it's a very smart use of DSP. Yeah, very smart. Smart people over there at Kef. Uh, as far as cons, the fan noise, the price, $1,999, I think is pretty up there, but it's not my money to decide. It's for you to decide whether this is something you'd like. I think this is more geared towards an audiophile. But if that's the case, I wish they would have had that delay on the RCA outputs for that audio file who may not want to use room correction in order to delay their speakers. I feel like Kef should have kind of taken initiative and done that themselves. That's pretty much it. I like the smart things that they're doing with this. I think it's really cool. I think if they just made a larger subwoofer, you're getting more out of it, right? To make a car analogy, I don't know if it's like pressing the NOS button whenever it's enabling it to hit these loud, low frequencies from a smaller enclosure, or if it's like a turbocharger, right? If I have a larger subwoofer, it can sustain those output levels. It can play all those frequencies at a loud volume, kind of like a big old muscle car, right? You get that linear power. Whereas this is more like a four cylinder with a turbo, you know what I mean? So it has output capability, but you have to, you have to be careful. You got to make sure that you're, you shift gears, make sure you're in that proper range to get the maximum power. And that's what the DSP here is doing automatically. Hopefully that made sense. I was trying, I was racking my brain to try to figure out an analogy that would work. But if you guys have any questions about this, I'll be in the comment section for a while to try to answer as many as possible. Please comment if you have this and let me know what you think of it. I know a lot of people love their older Kef KF92. You guys know who you are. A lot of people like their Kef KC62. I know Kef has a fan base. They make great stuff and a lot of design and research goes into it and measurements based. So I like that about them. So I'm going to go ahead and put this on my speaker leaderboard. The link will be here. Was that a fair review? Even though it was sponsored, you guys tell me, let me know. Anyway, if you enjoyed the video, Make sure to like, subscribe, and if you want to watch others related to this topic, click somewhere up here.